Matt Ross, uh, you wrote and directed the film Captain Fantastic. Where did you get the idea for this movie? Uh, well, the initial idea probably started um, a couple years ago when I was thinking about um, my failures as a parent. Um, <laughs> I have two kids and when I was, I, at the time, I was, I was thinking a great deal about a couple things, really. Um, how difficult it is to be present in our lives with, um, or I should say, with the people in our lives. Like, you know, we are always uh, attached to our computers and our phones, and I was feeling that really palpably um, with my kids. I think at one point my, my son said to me, hey, Dad, could you not be on your phone right now? And what he was responding to is, you know, my phone is my mobile office, like all, for all of us. I, I was getting emails from someone and they wanted a response immediately. Anyway, that, was, that, was, that started one of the things I was thinking about. Um, I was thinking a lot about my values and what I was passing on to my kids or what I was not passing on to my kids and how important it was to me to do that. I mean, I think we all want to, whether you have, well, if you have kids, you, you think about, you know, of course you, you want to protect them and you want to prepare them for the world. And you also want to help them not make the same mistakes you made, you know? And I was thinking about all these things and I start fantasizing about, because I'm pulled between my professional and my personal life so much as we all are, you know, you don't have to have kids. You can be in a relationship and have that same problem. And I was thinking a lot about well, what, would be, what would it be like if I could give up all my, you know, gave up my career and devoted my entire life to my kids. What would that be like? What what would I be able to achieve? Uh, and whether that was a healthy idea or a crazy idea. So I think that was the beginning of it, uh, the initial spark, probably. Right, and I think what's so interesting about it, as you said, would that be a good idea or would that be a bad idea? And I think that you do a good job of showing uh, the idealism. Mm -hmm. of living off the grid, in a sense, and of uh, raising your kids away from modern society. But on the other hand, showing the downside of that. You know, does that really prepare them for the world? Um, so talk a little bit more about writing the script and figuring that out. So I, um, I wrote the film while I was editing my last movie, which is a movie called 28 Hotel Rooms. And we shot that movie it was Christmas and um, we're in Ireland and my phone, talking about phones being connected. Um, uh, ding, ding, pay attention to me now, now, now. Um, so, uh, that movie stars uh, Christmas scene and we're in Ireland and we shot it somewhat like a documentary in that each scene as written, as scripted, but then we did a lot of improvisation. And so I had a lot of footage and uh, I edited over the course of about nine months and as I was um, editing that film, and we were taking breaks because the editor, Joe Krings, lives in New York. Um, I, would be, I was writing that film, and um, I, I think um, well, I actually lost the track of thought. What, what, the, my, my train of thought. What were you asking about the specifics? Oh, about yeah, of writing the script and, and figuring out the story of it. Well, the initial idea was what I said to you, and then I, I tried a, a variety of manifestations of that father and in the beginning he was a little more permissive and um, I realized that it didn't yield the best drama necessarily you know if, if drama is conflict uh, I, I think there needed to be a little more rigidity uh, I never imagined it that he was a, di a dictator or that he was abusive but I always thought that it was important because I really was conscious and wanted to create a transformational journey. I really, I, lo I love movies that start one place and end up someplace entirely different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in order to craft that, the idea of the bigger the front, the bigger the back, I needed there to be more conflict. And so I, I started changing his behavior and having him be a little bit more of a taskmaster and having this kind of curriculum that he conceived of probably with his wife and, and, Well, his intentions are in the right place. You know, I mean, having them read books and uh, talk about why they like them or why they don't like them, uh, having them uh, exercise, you know, um, and being. Yeah, no, I, think, I think he's admirable. I mean, you know, I, I hope, 
I really mean this when I say I want everyone to have their own experience, and you could hate him and think he's a terrible father, or you could think the opposite, think he's the best in the world. But I, I, I think if you're asking, for me, he's, he's nothing if not admirable. He's flawed, as we all are, but I think he's, he's, he's not trying to create a world that didn't exist. Uh, I, I don't think he would deny modern medicine. He's, but he is someone who's that modern life is frequently very out of balance and is trying to balance a little more. In fact, really at the heart of it, it's a story about a man who's who's out of balance and is at the end has has um, achieved a certain amount of equilibrium. Right, and I think the movie makes the case as well that there is no right way or wrong way to raise your children. Uh, there's. You always try to raise them the right way, and you show the contrast between the way he raises his kids and the way that his sister raises his kids. Yeah. Um, and so I mean, grandmother and grandmother May, if they were short. Right. Right. Yes. Um, so now you mentioned this was your second film, and it's very different stylistically from your first film as a director. What did you learn on that film that you uh, utilized in this film? What was uh, the learning curve like? I guess. Well, the learning curve was huge in that the first movie was a tiny, tiny, it was a micro budget film. It was two people in a series of hotel rooms. There was never, there were two actors in the entire movie. There was one scene that took place in a hotel bar with extras, but otherwise it was just two actors uh, in a series of hotel rooms. And so we never had a crew of more than probably 18 or 19 people. And frankly, we could have even done it with less, but um, we had an excellent small crew. Captain Fantastic was a was a much bigger endeavor, you know, with a full full crew and um, you know legitimate amount of shooting days. And uh, in fact, Twenty Hotel Rooms ill prepared me for this movie in the <laughs> sense that I had developed a certain style of my own that I liked. It's not it's not my own in the sense that no one else does it, but it was something that I felt very comfortable doing, which is. You know, filmmaking is all about time and money, and money determines how much time you have. And when you only have two people in a room, if, if your schedule is, is like this, from, you know, from call time until lunch, you're in this hotel room. And then after lunch, until you wrap, you're in this hotel room. You have a lot of flexibility. There's no moving around. It's just you're just in this room solving the problems of the script and trying a variety of ways. When you're doing Captain Fantastic, and in a single day, we might be at a grocery store, and then on a rock face, and then you know back in the bus to, to do the kind of exploration that I had become accustomed to and, and comfortable um, uh, with. So that was a big problem for me, making that adjustment. And in fact, I was, I was, I was um, prepared for the challenges of, of this one. You know, every, I say this frequently, it's true, every movie has its own unique challenges. Captain Fantastic was, uh, we have six kids in every scene. With child labor laws, you have to factor into the, the, the idea that they can't work for full days ever. The movie, so we're in a different location every day. Uh, we have two stunts with kids and two musical um, numbers with kids. Uh, because we're a road movie and we're in different locations every day, some of those locations are far off in the woods that take. So, you know, all those things eat up your time. And we're also in two states. So all those things eat up your time. And I think for me, the learning curve, specifically directorially, is about time management more than anything. Mm -hmm. I realized how little time I had to explore the way I like to. Because I really like the idea of trying to break down this concept that the actors are required to deliver uh, a kind of performance between action and cut. This idea that you, you invite everyone to set, you turn on the cameras, and they deliver a performance. Great, perfect, let's move on. I think that's really antithetical to, well, it is antithetical to exploration, but to filmmaking itself. I think that the idea of like carving, of honing, of honing, of honing. And so you try it one way, let's see if that works, let's try it another way. You keep on playing and playing and exploring, and that takes time. So going forward, I need to make sure I'm building more of that. Well, you have had a long career as an actor, um, most notably of late on Silicon Valley as Gavin Belson. So how did that help prepare you to become a director? I mean, you uh, I can put it this way. Well, the simplest thing to say is that I love actors and I love the craft of acting and I have nothing but respect and admiration for it. And it's done well. It's, it's, you know, it's a craft and an art. And 
I've unfortunately been in positions where that's not the case coming from the director. You know, I've worked with directors who care a lot about the camera and know a lot of, come from a technical um, background, either commercials or videos, but they don't come from the theater necessarily, and they know they don't understand acting, and they let you do what you want, or they're um, uh, obstructionist, which isn't helpful. Um, I've worked with the opposite, directors who care a great deal about acting and don't know anything about the technical aspects of the DP set up the shot or just are kind of reflecting but not in control of that. And I've worked with directors who know a great deal, I mean, we know nothing about either, and I'm sort of confused as to why they're a director. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I've worked with directors who know a great deal about both, and I think that's your job, you know? So my, perhaps is through acting or that I care about acting, but I, I care equally about the technical aspects. Um, I'm a, a gear geek and I'm a photographer and, you know, I, I know what the lenses are there for and, and how to use them. Um, and, but I think uh, certainly being an actor is helpful in that and the actor's process and the difficulty of film acting and I think I'm able to help, frankly. You know, whether I can solve the problem, I don't know. But I can. I, I think we speak the same language and 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 can be helpful in that regard. Um, you know, more to the point, I think. And again, this is something I've said many times, but I really do believe it. I kind of think that most iconic film moments are acting moments. You know, when you, when you talk about a movie you love. You or I, or people who are involved in the business, might say, "Oh, that was an incredible dolly shot," or "I loved how the dolly shot hit and the music and and the car." You know, the, we might we might analyze it from a technical point of view, but I think most people, audience members, people who are not in the industry, go to have an interaction with a human being revealing themselves, and whether it's you know Vigo crying or laughing or some revelation that happens through the actor. That's what they're going for. We're having, we're looking for that human connection, uh, and so I care about that. I guess. Right. Well, you certainly have a great performance in Viggo Mortensen. Uh, what made him right to play Captain Fantastic? Uh, many things. Uh, they or you know, technically, he's the right age. I needed someone who's who you believe. The things coming out of his mouth would come out of his mouth. Um, uh, this physically fit. Uh, I didn't know anything about Vigo personally, other than things I had read. I didn't know him. I know him now, but I didn't know him before. And preconceived notions of actors who they may be based on their work, which is of course false. You know, uh, someone who plays scientists may in fact have. Uh, no knowledge of science whatsoever. And, and it, it, the job is not about being an expert, it's about allowing us to believe or suspending our disbelief that we believe this person can do these things. So I didn't know about Vigo. It turns out that in fact, he has many of the skills that, are, that the character has in the film. Uh, he's very comfortable in the natural environment. He's a woodsman of sorts. Uh, he's, he's incredibly well read. I had sent him a box of books that I wanted him to read that I thought the character uh, would have read and Vigo had read, I think all of them, except for one about a, um, contemporary Olympic athletic training, um, you know, poetry and Chomsky and Howard Zinn and um, corporations and a lot, a lot of things. And he had read them all. So, you know, he's, um, uh, he was the right man for the job, but, um, you know, and he brings his own qualities. Every actor, you know, you and I could sit and throw out names and spitball names, and and we could think of other fantastic actors who would make the film their own version of that character. You know, um, I, I'm uh, Vigo was my first choice, and I was very fortunate to get him because he's a. I think he's one of our greats. I think Vigo is. A, you know, I say this frequently, and it's true. He he doesn't have inorganic moments, and you kind of don't catch him acting, um, which you know leads this kind of, of um, authenticity. You know, he also brings an intelligence and a gravitas to everything he does. Um, I think he's a great artist. Absolutely. Uh, and you surround him in the film with a lot of great actors, but particularly the children. Uh, was it difficult finding six interesting children who could play well-read and athletic and uh, intelligent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it took a long time. Uh, I saw a lot of kids. 
because we live, you know, I mean, you and I are talking through our computers. Um, I saw hundreds of audition tapes from all over the world, you know, from pretty much every English speaking country, all over Great Britain, all over um, Australia, New Zealand, all over the UK, uh, the, uh, the United States, Canada. I think we even got a couple tapes from South Africa. And I, I watched all these tapes. I didn't watch all of them. I watched, I would watch the first scene of every one. I'd still be watching them if I watched all of them. And it was pretty amazing. You know, the kids, kids said, we asked them to send in skills and uh, amazing skills from trapeze artists to amazing gymnasts and singers and musicians. And you know, on paper, it's a tall order. You have to be well, you have to, we have to believe again, these kids are this well read. Physical ability, they need to be physically fit. Uh, there were a lot of skills that we hoped um, to bring to the film. Now, again, you, we did a boot camp where we taught them a lot, and you can't expect them to be experts in any of these things. It's impossible. But you, you know, you, you hope to teach them enough so that you can suspend their disbelief. And we got really lucky. The other thing about kids is that you cast their parents. You don't think about that or know, really have that idea. Going forward, I would know that. Uh, and they can make the, the entire process a joy or a hell. And in our experience, we had incredible parents who loved the movie, loved the script, loved the endeavor, and they were nothing if not joyous and made the whole process possible. We need them there. So. Absolutely. And, you know, this is a film that a lot of people are still discovering, you know. I mean, it's played in theaters, but a lot of people are, you know, still catching up with it and, and loving it and enjoying it and recommending it to their friends. What do you hope people take from the film when they see it? Uh, well, it's true. I mean, we live in a culture where um, people don't go to the movies the way they, they used to. They go to the theaters the way they used to. And a lot of people see things on, you know, VOD. And I've certainly, since it's come out a week or two ago, I've gotten a lot of emails on a daily basis from people who are seeing it. I, you know, I didn't have a, to answer your question, I didn't have a, I was trying to deliver. Uh, I, I think what I hope people take away from it, what I hope they get from it, is what I want in a movie. I want to have an experience that's an emotional experience. I want to mo be moved, I want to laugh, or I want to cry, hopefully both, but I'd like to have one. And I want to be intellectually stimulated. You know, I see a lot of movies that do for me, and sometimes they're extraordinary, um, but few movies that do both. And that's the, that's the secret sauce that I'm always looking for. I want to, you know, I want to have a, I want to have both an emotional and intellectual response, and so I hope that when people discover the movie, whether they like it or dislike it, whether they think he's a great father or a terrible father, I hope it challenges them, and I hope they have that those two experiences uh, really well. Well, it's a great movie, and uh, congratulations on it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. Thanks for talking to me. You're welcome. Thank have you. a great. You too. Thanks. You too.